Okay, thank you. So thank you very much for uh, allowing me to give this talk with a different multi-object spectrographic uh, spectrograph on a different telescope. Uh, I'd like to tell you about local group science with the Subaru Prime Focus Spectrograph. Uh, I'm the co-chair of a working group that's called Galactic Archaeology, but what we're doing or what we're planning to do is actually science throughout the local group, extending to M31. So I'm very grateful to Ivana for that lovely summary in what we can do with M31. And Ivana is also a member of the PFS collaboration. So what is the prime focus spectrograph? Here's a sort of list of fairly technical details of what it is and what it will be. It's currently being constructed. I've just highlighted here what I think are perhaps the most important characteristics for this audience. Science operation and survey program from 2023. Uh, has the same wide field corrector as Hyper Supreme Cam that gives us a 1.25 square degree field of view. And over that fairly large field of view, we have about 2,400 fibers. The fiber positioners, the Cobra, it has rapid reconfiguration time of between one to two minutes. So this allows us to reassign fibers very quickly, allowing a dynamic survey strategy. There, it's a three-arm spectrograph. Most of the stellar science will be using the blue arm and the red arm. In the blue, we have a low resolution mode. The resolution is about 2300, the resolving power. And we have a medium resolution mode in the red that was particularly uh, pushed for by Evan Kirby, who's also on here, so that uh, we could get elemental abundances for stars. So we have a medium resolution mode R of about 5,000, which is very similar to the DEMOS setup that Ivan Escala was just talking about. So we have lots of fibers, large field of view. It's an eight meter telescope. So the science we're aiming for is to go beyond that you can do with a four meter telescope, pushing into the outer parts of our galaxy and towards M M31, M33. Just a few words of what the PFS collaboration is. It's the builders of the instrument and proposers of a planned 360 night survey, which we intend to do over five to six years. We're in, in uh, the throes of preparing to propose for this survey as a Subaru strategic program. It's a large and growing, there's still room for more partners, international partnership that's led out of IPMU in Tokyo, P.I. Hitoshi Murayama. Important person, overall guru is Jim Gunn. Uh, science team, I've already mentioned working groups. There's three working groups. So, so the science team is led by Masahiro Takada and Richard Ellis, be familiar to you. We have three working groups, cosmology, galaxy evolution, galactic archeology. span I mentioned I'm co-chair. The other co-chairs are Masashi Shiba of Tohoku University and Judy Cohen of Caltech. So this Subaru strategic program is entitled Cosmic Evolution in the Dark Center. Overall thrust is that, and we have these three working groups, each of which is addressing a different aspect of the evolution of galaxies and their associated dark matter halos. This is just a table indicating some different aspects of the science cases of testing the nature of dark matter through 
dark matter density profile, say, in dwarf spheroidals, and also what's the mass hierarchy of neutrinos from the cosmology part of the survey. So different aspects of the assembly of the light and dark universe from these three different aspects of the, the, uh, the science survey. So I'm here to tell you something about the galactic archaeology, the science that the galactic archaeology working groups developing. It's really local group archaeology because we want to address the assembly history and structures of the baryonic components and the dark matter halos of not just the Milky Way, but also M31 and the dwarf spheroidal satellites of the Milky Way. So as part of the science, we need imaging for targeting. And I mentioned that prime focus spectrograph is complementary to hyper supreme cam. We use hyper supreme cam photometry for much of the targeting. We have broadband photometry. And in many of the fields, we have narrowband imaging NB515 filter. This is a gravity sensitive magnet, excuse me, magnesium B feature. Uh, and so it helps us to distinguish foreground main sequence stars from member giant stars in the dwarfs in an M31. And we're developing hierarchical Bayesian mixture models to analyze the broadband color magnitude diagrams in the fields where we only have that uh, in terms of, again, giving us information as to what's a foreground star and what's a member of the galaxy of interest. Main thrust, of course, is spectroscopy down to an apparent magnitude of about 22 and a half. We're aiming to get chemical abundances carbon from the G band in the blue, alpha to iron, not only overall alpha, but hopefully individual alpha elements, nickel to iron, all to about 0.2 dex. And of course, we're also going to get line of sight velocities from the spectra, aiming to get around five kilometers a second. Hopefully samples of a few times 10 to the four, stars in each of the satellites. Well, if they're luminous enough, as you see, we're looking at some very faint satellites, different fields in the Milky Way and in M31. Uh, we are aiming to go beyond the Gaia limit for parallaxes. So for distances, we'll use spectrophotometry, ages from isochrone fitting and for proper motions, again, beyond Gaia, we'll use some combination of Pan-Star, Sloan, Hyper Supreme Pam, the Rubin Telescope, whatever's available. And for the abundances, we're going to Two use minutes. both tra both traditional and, and, and machine learning. Two minutes, I better hurry up. Uh, the targets, outer disk of the Milky Way, warping, flaring, phase space structure, quantify the effects of the ongoing mer merger with Sagittarius, again, pushing out to 30 kiloparsecs beyond what the four meters can do, fields in the distant field halo of the Milky Way, identify streams, look for trying to understand merger history, M31, going 10 to the four red giant stars with chemical abundances, really try to disentangle substructure in the field halo from substructure that is disturbed disk. And very interesting here, non-member red giants are going to probe the edge of the stellar halo of the Milky Way. Where does our halo end? Where does M31's halo begin? The dwarf spheroidals that we're going to be looking at cover a range of stellar mass and star formation histories, including an ultra faint dwarf, luminosity about three times 10 to the four stellar, sorry, solar masses. We want a range of stellar masses and star formation histories to test the effects of stellar feedback on the dark matter density profiles. We're going to target fields 
beyond the nominal tidal radius of these galaxies, get total masses, get large enough samples of stars that we can study the line of sight velocity distribution, do Schwarzschild modeling, not just look at velocity dispersion as a function of projected distance, and uh, get the mass profile, get the star formation history from the combination of the chemical abundances, which of course we're also going to get the chemical abundances and the color magnitude diagrams, really refine the star formation histories, and again, figure out stellar is the stellar feedback uh, that we think you can get from the star formation histories. Is that sufficient to change the dark matter profile. So I have almost no time, so you can ask me about this later, but again, outer disk beyond the four meters, out beyond the nominal edge of the stellar disk so far, but we want to really see what's going on in the outer parts where we know we have a very disturbed disk. We need large samples of stars, so we're going to do of order 40 fields in the outer disk. Galactoseismology is a really exciting field right now. We're going to participate in that. Field halo, we're going to look at canonical fields, again, or fields at canonical coordinates, again, looking very faint into the outer halo, where, as we've heard, dynamical times are the longest, so we can see substructure the longest. M31, Ivana just gave a wonderful introduction to what you can do. Let me just show you where our fields are. There is the little galaxy that Ivana started with the image. This is the pandas map. Red are the intended fields of the PFS survey of M31. And here's our PFS limit getting the first tip and down magnitude or so of the giant branch, also targeting M31. Dwarf spheroidals, well, as I mentioned, range of star formation history and stellar luminosity in our sample of six or so dwarf spheroidals, including the Booties one ultra faint dwarf. Not effective it's believed stellar feedback's not effective once you get to low enough luminosities. We have a galaxy in that regime, so we're going to get the mass profiles, hopefully, of this large range of uh, star formation histories and stellar luminosities. Just showing you our intended pointings way beyond the tidal radius, nominal tidal radius, of course, it's derived from what's known about star count so far, but in all these cases, we know there are radial velocity members beyond the nominal tidal radius. We really want to understand what's going on. So just my concluding remarks that uh, it's going to enable multifaceted investigations into the dark and light universe. And we want to study not just the Milky Way, but also M30. M31, hopefully also M33. You will have noticed, I didn't mention it, but a few fields down there in M33. And also the dwarf spheroidals combination of stellar kinematics and abundances. Thank you. Thanks, Rosie, for that very interesting introduction to an exciting survey. Um, do we have questions? So I'll, I'll, I have several, but I'll start with one. Um, so at the start, you mentioned that there's three arms to the spectrograph and you really only showed the, the resolution for the kind of the optical and the very, the 710 to 800 nanometers at higher resolution, but there's a third arm in the near IR. What's the wavelength coverage of that in the resolution? Uh, oh dear, um, let me, so the resolution is basically, the same as the low resolution in the blue. 
and the coverage is out to 1260 nanometers. So it's basically continuous. It's from 380 to 1260 at low resolution. And for Stellar, we have this added capability of medium resolution so that we can get improved Stellar parameters. Yeah, because I have a feeling that near IR will help in getting, you might be able to get the carbon to nitrogen ratio for the giants, which might let you estimate the ages independent of isochrones. Um, yes. So yes. for studying Andromeda, that would be very, very interesting. Yes. Um, we do intend to use the near infrared arm, but at present we've been focusing on what we can get with uh, the blue and the red. But certainly we, we intend to use the near infrared arm and what you're suggesting would indeed be very interesting. Yeah. Uh, there's a question in the chat here from Sanjeev. He's asking why the uh, expected abundance precision isn't higher given the resolutions and wavelength coverages you, you have. Because uh, uh, you said 0.2 dex, but even like Lamost is getting to 0.1 with worse, a worse spectrograph on paper. <laughs> yeah, we're being conservative right now. Actually, I think. Um, the formal uncertainties that actually Ivana Escala might want to jump in here, the formal uncertainties are indeed significantly smaller, but we're being conservative right now in saying what we're gonna get, yeah. Okay. Uh, we have another question in the room, uh, Dan. Can I just speak really loudly? Can you hear me, Rosie? Yes, I can hear you, Dan. Yes. <laughs> great, great talk, really exciting. I do have a question about the wavelength range for the red spectrograph. Um, it looks like it, it, on your slide, it says it cuts off at 800 nanometers. Uh, is that, is that um, a typo or are you, it seems strange that you're leaving out calcium triplet. Ah, that's a typo, I'm sorry, oops. <laughs> I should fix that. Uh, are you wanting our slides? Uh, Jeffrey? Uh, they've been recorded. So. Uh, all the talks oh. are recorded, so we have them all already. <laughs> so, oh, okay. I so, no, I was just meaning, can I fix it before uh, I yes. give you my slide? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Mm. And I'm totally blanking out on what it is. Yeah. yeah. So, so what is the, what is the uh, red end of the... That's why I said I'm just blanking out on what it is. Let me, uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. is. Evan's still on here, right? Can Evan answer that? Oh, yes, Evan can say. <laughs> it's, it's a little beyond 900 if memory serves. I th okay, thanks. It definitely includes the calcium trip, no doubt about that. Yes, yes. And another reason that uh, we have medium resolution is for better radial velocities as well, because a huge portion of the PFS science case is for uh, the, the dynamics of these galaxies. Yes, thank you, Evan. Thank you. I assume my typo there, I meant to put 900. <laughs> Sorry. 